Good evening, and welcome to our midweek meditation. Tonight, a story, a song, and some words from Jesus. The story is from the writer Roald Dahl, whom we know as the author of such classics as James and the Giant Peach and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, among many other wondrous books. The song is a small song that I wrote many years ago. The words from Jesus are found in Luke 23, verse 34. Let's begin with the story, an excerpt from Roald Dahl's book, Boy, recounting events from his own childhood in England. Roald Dahl writes, we called them masters in those days, not teachers. And at St. Peter's boarding school, the one I feared most of all, apart from the headmaster, was Captain Hardcastle. This man was slim and wiry, and he played football. On the football field, he wore white running shorts and white gym shoes and short white socks. His legs were as hard and thin as ram's legs, and the skin around his calves was almost exactly the color of mutton fat. The hair on his head was not ginger. It was brilliant dark vermilion, like a ripe orange, and it was plastered back with immense quantities of brilliantine in the same fashion as the headmaster's. The parting on his hair was a white line straight down the middle of the scalp, so straight it could only have been made with a ruler. On either side of the parting, you could see the comb tracks running back through the greasy orange hair like little tram lines. Captain Hardcastle sported a mustache that was the same color as his hair. And oh, what a mustache it was, a truly terrifying sight, a thick orange hedge that sprouted and flourished between his nose and his upper lip and ran clear across his face from the middle of one cheek to the middle of the other. But this was not one of those nail brush mustaches, all short and clipped and bristly, nor was it long and droopy in the walrus style. Instead, it was curled most splendidly upward all the way along as though it had had a permanent wave put into it, or possibly curling tongs heated in the mornings over a tiny flame of methylated spirits. The only other way he could have achieved this curling effect, we boys decided, was by prolonged upward brushing with a hard toothbrush in front of the looking glass every morning. Behind the mustache there lived an inflamed and savage face with a deeply corrugated brow that indicated a very limited intelligence. Life is a puzzlement, the corrugated brow seemed to be saying, and the world is a dangerous place. All men are enemies and small boys are insects that will turn and bite you if you don't get them first and squash them hard. Captain Hardcastle was never still. His orange head twitched and jerked perpetually from side to side in the most alarming fashion, and each twitch was accompanied by a little grunt that came out of the nostrils. He had been a soldier in the army in the Great War, and that, of course, was how he had received his title. But even small insects like us knew that Captain was not a very exalted rank, and only a man with little else to boast about would hang on to it in civilian life. It was bad enough to keep calling yourself Major after it was all over, but Captain was the Bottoms. Rumor had it that the constant twitching and jerking and snorting was caused by something called shell shock, but we were not quite sure what that was. We took it to mean that an explosive object had gone off very close to him with such an enormous bang that it had made him jump high in the air, and he hadn't stopped jumping since. For a reason that I could never properly understand, Captain Hardcastle had it in for me from my very first day at St. Peter's. Perhaps it was because he taught Latin and I was no good at it. Perhaps it was because already at the age of nine, I was very nearly as tall as he was. Or even more likely, it was because I took an instant dislike to his giant orange mustache and he often caught me staring at it with what was probably a little sneer under the nose. I had only to pass within 10 feet of him in the corridor and he would glare at me and shout, hold yourself straight, boy, pull your shoulders back, or take those hands out of your pockets, 
Or, what's so funny, may I ask? What are you smirking at? Or most insulting of all, you, what's your name? Get on with your work. I knew, therefore, that it was only a matter of time before gallant captain nailed me good and proper. The crunch came during my second term when I was exactly nine and a half, and it happened during evening prep. Every weekday evening, the whole school would sit for one hour in the main hall between six and seven o'clock to do prep. The master on duty for the week would be in charge of prep, which meant that he sat high up on a dais at the top of the hall and kept order. Some masters read a book while taking prep and some corrected exercises, but not Captain Hardcastle. He would sit up there on the dais, twitching and grunting, and never once would he look down at his desk. His small, milky blue eyes would rove the hall for the full 60 minutes, searching for trouble, and heaven help the boy who caused it. The rules of prep were strict but simple. You were forbidden to look up, look up from your work, and you were forbidden to talk. That was all there was to it but it left you precious little leeway. In extreme circumstances, and I never knew what these were, you could put your hand up and wait until you were asked to speak, but you had better be awfully sure that the circumstances were extreme. Only twice during my four years at St. Peter's did I see a boy putting up his hand during prep. The first one went like this. Master, what is it? Boy, please, sir, May I be excused to go to the, to the lavatory? Certainly not, you should have gone before. But sir, please sir, I didn't want to before, I, I didn't know. Whose fault was that? Get on with your work. But sir, oh sir, please let me go. One more word out of you and you'll be in trouble. Naturally, the wretched boy dirtied his pants, which caused a storm later on upstairs with the matron. On the second occasion, I remember, remember clearly that it was a summer term, and the boy who put his hand up was called Braithwaite. I also seem to recollect that the master who was taking prep was our friend Captain Hardcastle, but I wouldn't swear to it. The dialogue went something like this. Master, yes, what is it? Braithwaite, please, sir, a wasp came in through the window, and it stung me on my lip, and it's swelling up. A what? A wasp, sir. Speak up, boy, I can't hear you. A what came in through the window? It's hard to speak up, sir, with my lip all swelling up. With your what all swelling up? Are you trying to be funny? No, sir, I promise I'm not, sir. Talk properly, boy. What is the matter with you? I've told you, sir, I've been stung, sir. My lip is swelling. It's hurting terribly. Hurting Terribly? What's hurting terribly? My lip, sir, is getting bigger and bigger. What prep are you doing tonight? French verbs, sir. We have to write them out. No, sir. No, sir. I don't, sir. But you see, all I see is that you're making an infernal noise and disturbing everyone in the room. Now get on with your work. They were tough, those masters. Make no mistake about it. And if you wanted to survive, you had to become pretty tough yourself. My own turn came, as I said, during my second term, and Captain Hardcastle was again taking prep. You should know that during prep, every boy in the hall sat at his own small, individual wooden desk. These desks had the usual sloping wooden tops with a narrow, flat strip at the far end where there was a groove to hold your pen, and a small hole in the right-hand side in which the inkwell sat. The pens we used had detachable nibs, and it was necessary to dip your nib into the inkwell every six or seven seconds when you were writing. Ballpoint pens and felt pens had not then been invented, and fountain pens were forbidden. The nibs we used were very fragile, and most boys kept a supply of new ones in a small box in their trouser pockets. Prep was in progress. Captain Hardcastle was sitting up on the dais in front of us, stroking his orange mustache, twitching his head, and grunting through the nose. His eyes roved the hall endlessly, searching for mischief. The only noises to be heard were Captain Hardcastle's little snorting grunts and the soft sound of pen nibs moving over paper. 
Occasionally there was a ping as somebody dipped his nib too violently into his tiny white porcelain inkwell. Disaster struck when I foolishly stubbed the tip of my nib into the top of my desk. The nib broke. I knew I hadn't got a spare one in my pocket. But a broken nib was never accepted as an excuse for not finishing prep. We had been set an essay to write and the subject was the life story of a penny. I still have that essay in my files. I had made a decent start and I was rattling along fine when I broke that nib. There was still another half hour of prep to go and I couldn't sit there doing nothing all that time. Nor could I put my hand up and tell Captain Hardcastle I had broken my nib. I simply did not dare. And as a matter of fact, I really wanted to finish that essay. I knew what was going to happen to my penny through the next two pages and I couldn't bear to leave it unsaid. I glanced to my right. The boy next to me was called Dobson. He was the same age as me, nine and a half, and a nice fellow. Even now, 60 years later, I can still remember that Dobson's father was a doctor and that he lived, as I had learned from the label on Dobson, Dobson's tuck box, at the Red House, Uxbridge, Middlesex. Dobson's desk was almost touching mine. I thought I would risk it. I kept my head lowered, but watched Captain Hardcastle very carefully. When I was fairly sure he was looking the other way, I put a hand in front of my mouth and whispered, Dobson. Dobson, could you lend me a nib? Suddenly there was an explosion up on the dais. Captain Hardcattle had leapt to his feet and was pointing at me and shouting, You're talking! I saw you talking! Don't try to deny it! I distinctly saw you talking behind your hand. I sat there frozen with terror. Every boy stopped working and looked up. Captain Hardcastle's face had gone from red to deep purple and he was twitching violently. Do you deny you were talking, he shouted. N no, sir, but, but, no, but. And do you deny you were trying to cheat? Do you deny you were asking Dobson for your help with your work? N no, sir, I, I wasn't cheating. Of course you were cheating. Why else, may I ask, would you be speaking to Dobson? I take it you were not inquiring after his health? It's worth reminding the reader once again of my age. I was not a self-possessed lad of 14. Nor was I twelve or even ten years old, I was nine and a half. And at that age one is ill-equipped to tackle a grown-up man with flaming orange hair and a violent temper. One can do little else but stutter. I, I, I have broken my nib, sir, I whispered. I, I was asking Dobson if he c could lend me one, sir. You are lying, cried Captain Hardcastle and there was triumph in his voice. I always knew you were a liar and a cheat as well. All I wanted was a nib, sir. I'd shut up if I were you, thundered the voice on the dais. You'll only get yourself into deeper trouble. I am giving you a stripe. Those were indeed words of doom. A stripe. I am giving you a stripe. All around I could feel a kind of sympathy reaching out to me from every boy in the school, but nobody moved or made a sound. Here I must explain the, systems, the system of stars and stripes that we had at St. Peter's. For exceptionally good work, you could be awarded a quarter star. And a red dot was made with a crayon beside your name on the notice board. If you got four quarter stars, a red line was drawn through the four dots indicating that you had completed your star. However, for exceptionally poor work or bad behavior, you were given a stripe and that automatically meant a thrashing from the headmaster. Every master had a book of quarter stars and a book of stripes, and these had to be filled in and signed and torn out exactly like checks from a checkbook. The quarter stars were pink, and the stripes were a fiendish blue-green color. The boy who received a star or a stripe would pocket it until the following morning after prayers, when the headmaster would call upon anyone who had been given one or the other to come forward in front of the whole school and hand it in. Stripes were considered so dreadful that they were not given very often. In any one week it was unusual for more than two or three boys to receive stripes. And now Captain Hardcastle was giving one to me. Come here, he ordered. I got up from my desk and walked to the dais. 
He already had his book of stripes on the desk and was filling one out. He was using red ink. And along the line where it said reason, he wrote, talking in prep, trying to cheat and lying. He signed it and tore it out of the book. Then, taking plenty of time, he filled in the counterfoil. He picked up the terrible piece of green-blue paper and waved it in my direction, but he didn't look up. I took it out of his hand and walked back to my desk. The eyes of the whole school followed my progress. For the remainder of prep, I sat at my desk and did nothing. Having no nib, I was unable to write another word about the life story of a penny. But I was made to finish it the next afternoon instead of playing games. The following morning, as soon as prayers were over, the headmaster called for the quarter stars and stripes. I was the only boy to go up. The assistant masters were sitting on very upright chairs on either side of the headmaster, and I, got, I caught a glimpse of Captain Hardcastle, arms folded across his chest, head twitching, the milky blue eyes watching me intently, the look of triumph still glimmering on his face. I handed in my stripe. The headmaster took it and read the writing. Come and see me in my study, he said, as soon as this is over. Five minutes later, walking on my toes and trembling terribly, I passed through the green baize door and entered the sacred precincts where the headmaster lived. I knocked on his study door. Enter. I turned the knob and went into this large square room with bookshelves and easy chairs and the gigantic desk topped in red leather straddling the far corner. The headmaster was sitting behind the desk, holding my stripe in his finger. What have you got to say for yourself, he asked me, and the white shark's teeth flashed dangerously between his lips. I didn't lie, sir, I said. I promise I didn't, and I wasn't trying to cheat. Captain Hardcastle says you were doing both, the headmaster said. Are you calling Captain Hardcastle a liar? No, sir. Oh, oh, no, sir. I wouldn't if I were you. I had broken my nib, sir, and I was asking Dobson if he could lend me another. That is not what Captain Hardcastle says. He says you were asking for help with your essay. Oh, no, sir, I wasn't. I was a long way away from Captain Hardcastle, and I was only whispering. I don't think he could have heard what I said, sir. So you are calling him a liar. Oh, no, sir, no, sir, I would never do that. It was impossible for me to win against the headmaster. What I would have liked to have said was, yes, sir, if you really want to know, sir, I am calling Captain Hardcastle a liar because that's what he is. But it was out of the question. I did, however, have one trump card left to play, or I thought I did. You could ask Dobson, sir, I whispered. Ask Dobson, he cried. Why should I ask Dobson? He would tell you what I said, sir. Captain Hardcastle is an officer and a gentleman, the headmaster said. He has told me what happened. I hardly think I want to go around asking some silly little boy if Captain Hardcastle is speaking the truth. I kept silent. For talking in prep, the headmaster went on, for trying to cheat and for lying, I'm going to give you six strokes of the cane. He rose from his desk and crossed over to the corner cupboard on the opposite side of the study. He reached up and took from the top of it three very thin yellow canes, each with the bent over handle at one end. For a few seconds, he held them in his hands, examining them with some care. Then he selected one and replaced the other two on top of the cupboard. Bend over. I was frightened of that cane. There is no small boy in the world who wouldn't be. It wasn't simply an instrument for beating you. It was a weapon for wounding. It lacerated the skin. It caused severe black and scarlet bruising that took three weeks to disappear. And all the time during those three weeks, you could feel your heart beating along the wounds. I tried once more, my voice slightly hysterical now. I didn't do it, sir. I swear I'm telling the truth. Be quiet and bend over, over there, and touch your toes. Very slowly, I bent over. Then I shut my eyes and braced myself for the first stroke. Crack! It was like a rifle shot. 
with a very hard stroke of the cane on one's buttocks, the time lag before you feel any pain is about four seconds. Thus, the experienced caner will always pause between strokes to allow the agony to reach its peak. So for a few seconds after the first crack, I felt virtually nothing. Then suddenly came the frightful, searing, agonizing, unbearable burning across the buttocks. And as it reached its highest and most excruciating point, the second crack came down. I clutched hold of my ankles as tight as I could and bit into my lower lip. I was determined not to make a sound, for that would only give the executioner greater satisfaction. Crack! Five seconds pause. Crack! Another pause. Crack! And another pause. I was counting the strokes, and as the sixth one hit me, I knew I was going to survive in silence. That will do, the voice behind me said. I straightened and clutched my backside as hard as I possibly could with both hands. This is always the instinctive and automatic reaction. The pain is so frightful you try to grab hold of it and tear it away, and the tighter you squeeze, the more it helps. I did not look at the headmaster as I hopped across the thick red carpet toward the door. The door was closed and nobody was about to open it for me. So for a couple of seconds I had to let go of my bottom with one hand to turn the doorknob. Then I was out and hopping around in the hallway of the private sanctum. Directly across the hall from the headmaster's study was the assistant master's common room. They were all in there now, waiting to spread out to their respective classrooms. But what I couldn't help noticing, even in my agony, was that this door was open. Why was it open? Had it been left that way on purpose so that they could all hear more clearly the sound of the cane from across the hall? Of course it had. And I felt quite sure that it was Captain Hardcastle who had opened it. I pictured him standing there among his colleagues, snorting with satisfaction at every stinging stroke. Small boys can be very comradely when a member of their community has got into trouble, and even more so when they feel an injustice has been done. When I returned to the classroom, I was surrounded on all sides by sympathetic faces and voices, but one particular incident has always stayed with me. A boy of my own age called Hyten was so violently incensed by the whole affair that he said to me before lunch that day, you don't have a father. I do. I am going to write to my father and tell him what has happened, and he'll do something about it. He couldn't do anything, I said. Oh, yes, he could, Hyten said. And what's more, he will. My father won't let them get away with this. Where is he now? He's in Greece, Hyten said, in Athens. But that won't make any difference. Then and there, little Hyten sat down and wrote to the father he admired so much. But of course, nothing came of it. It was nevertheless a touching and generous gesture from one small boy to another, and I have never forgotten it. So ends our reading from Roald Dahl. A touching and generous gesture from one small boy to another, and I have never forgotten it. My guess is that you have some things that you have never forgotten in your life. And my guess is that most of those things are not the big things, but small things. Touching and generous gestures. Things that the world at large might not take notice of, yet things that made all the difference to you.
I walked alone. Each step I built a lonely one within, till I And that has been all.
beside me and as you die the end grew clear you shared my death you turned my dying into rising you became my freedom to keep on dying when you became my fear and that has been all the difference in my life all the difference in my life yes you have been I'll write a letter to my father for Roald Dahl, never forgotten. Think hard about that. A small gesture, writing a letter of indignation to a faraway parent, laughable to any adult, yet so powerful to Roald Dahl as to never be forgotten. Out of all the events in his childhood, this is what stood out. Of course, when we look out at our world, still so full of injustice, we might correctly say, as did Roald Dahl, that of course, nothing came of it. Yet something did come out of it. First of all, Roald Dahl never forgot it. More importantly, Roald Dahl was changed by it. He grew up to be not an enactor of punishment, but a teller of stories. Not a person who called for revenge, but a person who called for compassion, for listening, for understanding. So much for our story and our song. Now for our words from Jesus. In Luke chapter 6, we read that even after he had been beaten by the authorities, while he was hanging on a cross, dying, Jesus wrote a letter to his father. It was a short letter, undoubtedly insignificant, to most of those who surrounded that cross. In it, he did not say, Father, get your cane ready. There's some evil people who I'll be sending to your office. They'll be sorry then. No, from the cross, while suffering an unalterable injustice, Jesus wrote, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do.
When I look out at our world, still full of injustice, I might correctly say, as the onlookers probably said, of course, nothing came of it. But of course, something did come of it. Those who were touched by Jesus' words never forgot them. They were changed by them. For the author of Luke, out of all the great events of Jesus' life, this is what stood out. A small, seemingly powerless gesture. Yet it makes all the difference. On this evening, in the midst of a world so full of injustice, let us not forget that we are able, with our Savior, to say, Father, forgive them. To say, Father, forgive us. To say, Father, we are sorry. We know not what we do. The world may find Jesus' words, words laughable, but for those of us to whom they were directed, they cannot be forgotten. How shall we respond? Let us become people who call not for punishment, but for compassion, for listening, for understanding. People who forgive. Even when we think it's a small gesture, one that won't make a difference in the big picture. Even when we think it is powerless, that no one will notice. On the contrary, those who listen and hear will never forget it. They will be changed. We will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Thanks be to God. Amen.